know, the people who drank the Kool-Aid, the debates in the 19, who was that, the, was that Jonestown? Yeah. 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 Um, um, literally, the people who drank the Kool-Aid. Um, the, the, even the debates in the mid-90s in Chabad about the, the, what, the Rebbe was the Mashiach or not, they were playing out the same phenomena. It's because it's fundamentally very, very difficult for human beings to suppress the beliefs that they hold to be true for reasons that I want to unpack today. And it's much easier, therefore, to seek out new fact patterns. Now, thank God we have the internet in which any piece of information can get corroborated as a useful enough fact, right? And in fact, the whole phenomenon of trending topics on the internet is, is a result of the curation of, of narratives and facts into ways in which they affirm people's belief systems. So we're living in the hyper version of this, where it's virtually impossible to disconfirm, right, somebody's facts. We have fact checkers, but nobody cares, right? Um, so if I, because it doesn't really matter. Does the belief, does the idea, does the way of seeing the world matter? And can you assemble enough information or enough supporting evidence to reinforce that belief I to be the case? If I believe it, it must be true. Um, in fact, and then I, I want to go on, but. Just consider this, the, the, we have a, a term, a phenomenological term in comparative religion for an individual who has deeply held belief systems, who is confronted by a new fact pattern about the world, and who changes their belief system. What's that term called? Convert. A convert. convert. It's an incredible thing. And until the 20th century, where we have become much more essentially lenient about conversion because we have other problems that we're trying to solve, the convert is actually a radical thing. That's why you ha it needs to have its own term. The idea that a person would come out of one belief ecosystem and transform their beliefs about the world. In Jewish tradition, you would abandon your parents and become the child of Abraham and Sarah. Not only are you abandoning your belief systems, you're abandoning the whole framework from which you're born. The fact that we have a term a convert reminds us of how rare and radical and difficult it is for a person to actually undergo that type of experience. Most of us grow up with certain belief systems and value systems. We may take slight detours along the way, right? We shift here, we shift a little bit there, we get moved a little bit by the stories of history, but we wind up being shaped based on those belief systems much more closely adhering to those belief systems then we actually get derailed from them. What formulates the ways in which we go in pursuit of particular facts? And here's the simple math equation. Um, we'll call something like memory or storytelling plus values, have to ask where those come from, translate or equal our politics with which we use to go find the facts that we need. Now, it's not, I'm not saying that, our, that we do this naturally, or we do this mechanically. Right? It's not like I wake up in the morning and say, how do I add this plus this, and then where do I go look for my facts? But I want to suggest that this is actually operating for us on a regular basis. Now, let's play this out. And we're going to take today a small piece of this unit and look at a couple of different sources to play this out. What I'm suggesting is as follows. Memory and storytelling consists of at least three components. One component is personal memory. That is the period of history through which we live and the formative events that, that, um, that describe or that influence our lives. Let's pause on this for a moment. We know this to be true. We don't often interrogate it. But if you happen to have been born before 1948, or, before, or have come of age before 1967, odds are your relationship to Israel has a certain fixed quality that you can be angry about things that Israel does, but they've probably hooked you for the long run. Right. That is an accident of history. You happen to have been born at a particular time in which history was acting upon you and almost coercing you because you live through those moments to capture your attention in a particular way. And you wonder why grandparents and grandchildren oftentimes have difficult times talking to each other about Israel. Hypothesis number one is simply the accident of history. If you happen to have been born, I guess the last date for that generation is coming of age before 1976. 
which is Entebbe. The last moment in Israel's history of a kind of pure, unfettered sense of the miraculous. Something amazing is going on in the story that captures me and holds me that I may get angry with Israel over time, but I'm still trapped or I'm caught in this in a way that, that, um, that'll never get let go of. If you were born after 1976, the formative memories that you have in your personal memory, <laughs> right? the formative memories that you have are 1982, first intifada, second intifada, buses blowing up, um, an intractable peace process, the Rabin assassination, right? Um, the Iraq war, I mean, just hmm? Gaza, right? An endless stream of what might be, in historical retrospect, the normal stuff that a country has to navigate. But if, that, if those are the personal memories, that winds up defining or capturing a personal ethos, they're gonna take you in a radically different direction than 4867 and Antebi.